Well, they actually got built one. Uh, and it's always propulsion's fault that it was this time too, but I can't tell you about that. Uh, but, okay. but our real subject for today is low aspect ratio airplanes, and to some extent, why would an apparently sane, at least the people who don't know me very well, engineer build an airplane that looks like that? Because this is the facet mobile, which I flew here in 1994, so we're at the 25th anniversary, which is kind of scary. Uh, and that picture was actually published, this, this is one of the pictures that was published in Sport Aviation when we were here uh, in 94. But what I want to do, and please, 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 people, hold your questions to the end. I have got a lot of charts I need to get through because there's 25 years of history and a lot of good new work to, to relate. Uh, and I'm going to be going fast at the beginning just to try to get you to the new stuff at the end, but I need to set the background. So, uh, you know, other than, hey, it looks cool and it's fun, why would you do something like this? Well, you know, part of it came from five. Thinking about, oh come on, this is <coughs> uh, Thinking about the state of general aviation, you know, I learned how to fly in 1973 or so. Well, at that time, the U.S. aviation industry was just delivering something like 8,000 single-engine airplanes a year. Think about that by today's standards. My boy. Uh, by the time we get to 1980, the absolute bottom dropped out of that market, and it's never really recovered. Now, you see this chart ends in 2005 with a hopeful trend, and light sport has definitely improved things some. But fundamentally, uh, we have a problem. So, you know, if you're trying to solve a problem, the first thing you want to do is characterize what is the problem I'm trying to solve. And one of the things you really have to realize is what is a personal airplane about? Because what's interesting is if you look back in the 50s through the mid-60s, the general aviation companies like Cessna and Piper Beach were trying to sell single-engine general aviation airplanes as useful personal transportation. You know, they had this vision of the self-employed business person flying themselves around in their Cessna or their Bonanza or whatever. And that's really not what's happening. So if you take a look at what, what's an airplane really? Well, let's be honest, most of the time an airplane is a toy. It's a cool toy, but it's a toy. And what are we really doing? So what's most personal airplanes? Most of our flights are relatively short. I mean, some of us go along cross country. Most of our flights are relatively short. A lot of them are either round robins to get the $100 hamburger or sightseeing operations. We're operating on a small airports. Um, Sport airplanes are flown by private pilots, which are a problem for designers because of how marvelously proficient they are. <laughs> and cost is important because these airplanes are being bought with discretionary money. Most privately owned airplanes don't make money for their owners. And that means you're not amortizing the cost against the, the revenue it generates because it doesn't. So what do I need? I need it to be affordable. If I can't buy it, nothing else matters. I need it to be safe. And I needed to be safely operable with modest pilot skills. Because, let's be honest with ourselves, guys, none of us are going to fly, most of us anyway, are not going to fly enough to get much better than modestly good. And uh, you want a reasonably comfortable cockpit environment. Now, you know, opinions vary on what constitutes comfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I still own a Cessna 150, but I remember when I bought my 150 about, oh, 10 years ago, and I got in the airplane with someone who I had last flown a 150 with when we were 25 years younger. And we looked at each other and went, man, these things got smaller. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a pretty cramped cockpit. And you want good enough performance to do some, you know, do the kind of missions we want to do and have some fun with it. And maybe get somewhere on some mild cross countries. That pretty much said all that. We buy it with discretionary income. That's really important. These cost is really important. So let's take a look at what people really buy in. You know, there's this 
lovely concept in economics called revealed preferences, which says it doesn't matter what the focus groups say. The real question is what do people actually do when they're spending their own money and their own time and their own resources? And I found this fascinating. Cessna built 37,172s in 25 years. And in twice that amount of time, Beach sold 3,000 bonanzas. Now, you know, if you're giving me an airplane for free, I know which one I'm going to take. And it's not the 172. Because the 172 is about as unsexy as a good flying airplane can be. But it hits that mix in a place that a lot of people can afford and a lot of people they can fly safely. So that's part of what the market's telling you. The other question is price. Because one of the things that happened in the 80s is the price of the airplane started to go through the roof. And, you know, as we said, airplanes are bought with discretionary income. So I came up with the following theory. And that is that the price point should be roughly the equivalent of the cost of a top of the line production luxury car. That's the flinch point. Now by that I don't mean Ferraris, Lamborghinis, you know, or the supercar of your choice. I mean, Top of the line Cadillac, BMW, Lexus, something like that. And so let's let's put that first order to the test. And I have a much more quantitative chart that I've deleted in the interest of time. But when I learned how to fly, in 1973, a brand new Cessna 150 costs about a thousand dollars more than a Cadillac sedan to build. Put a few options on the caddy, and the two cost the same. Now that's really interesting. Because it means that somebody who really wants to fly back then can drive the car they're driving for another four years, take out the same loan they would have taken out to buy the luxury car, and have a brand new airplane. Now, roll the clock ahead to 2006, which is the last time I did that. They don't make 150s anymore, so I used the Diamond DA20, which was the closest equivalent, powered by the same engine, basically, right? And the Cadillac SDS, and holy hell, look what happened. Now the airplane costs like your house, not like your car. And what's interesting is I was able to actually get data on the price of the 150 for every year it was produced and the price of the Caddy for every year it was produced from various enthusiast organizations. And the two curves track beautifully that as long as the price of the airplane was below, at or below 125% of the price of the Cadillac, they were selling over 1,000 airplanes a year. As soon as it got above that, the bottom dropped out. So that kind of gives you an idea of the price point we have to be at uh, to have some chance of selling in some volume. Uh, moving on now to the safety aspect. First of all, a few quotes to put us in, in, in the right mood. Uh, the first is from the RAF, which is that when a crash, or in their case a prank, is inevitable, uh, seek to strike the softest, cheapest object in the vicinity as slowly and gently as possible. And then my favorite from the former Northrop Chief test pilot that the Piper Cub is the safest airplane in the world because it can just barely kill you. <laughs> uh, but both of these are speaking to the idea that uh, in order for an airplane to be survivable, you need to be able to maintain control and crash at low energy if you're going to crash. Because, you know, there's that old saw that uh, takeoffs or optional landings are mandatory. So once I'm airborne, I have a whole lot of choices of what could happen. Well, the first thing is they come into two categories, don't crash and crash. I would much rather stay and don't crash. Okay, normal arrival where I intended, this is what I want. Safe precautionary landing because it's getting foggy, something doesn't sound right in the engine, I'll take it. A safe force landing, okay, not the best day but I can repair the airplane or truck it out of there and I can go home to my family. I'll take it. Now, the next step is when you can't quite do that. Um, I've been through infassible will damage the airplanes, but not the people. And frankly, if the time comes that you have to throw away the hardware to save your body, do it. You know, one of the things I did right when the fastable build engine quit was to land straight ahead. If I had been three feet higher, I would have made it over the damn fence and to be able to look at the airplane out there instead of me telling you about why it's not being restored. Uh, you know, and then it gets progressively worse from there to really bad. Uh, all of the acceptable outcomes require the pilot to maintain control of the airplane. Because in general, if you can control the airplane unless you're in a really, really bad place in the sky, 
you can end up arriving at the ground in a survivable condition, provided the airplane will support that. And the big thing, the two big things we care about are speed and angle of impact when I get to the ground. This is a curve which is affectionately known by most of the people who've seen this before as the curve of doom. This is the angle between the flight path angle and the ground. This is the speed you're going, and if you're on this side of the line, you're dead. That doesn't mean you walk away from here. It means you can be pulled from the wreckage in repairable condition if it doesn't catch fire. A couple of interesting things from this curve. First of all, the unsurvivable speed is remarkably slow by airplane standards. If you think about it, it's about 80 knots, 75, 76 knots. It doesn't sound very fast, does it, that you're going to flat uncontrolled impact? But think about it. You know, a nautical mile is 150% of a mile per hour. So 75 knots is about 90 miles an hour. Imagine if I were to put you in your car, disable the brakes, disable the steering, and then drop you in random terrain at 90 miles an hour. That's what a forced landing like that is. So the other thing that's interesting is that as much as we love our peer friends at FAA, not all regulations are irrational. So for example, the 61 knot stall speed here which is the FAR Part 23 uh, stall speed for single engine airplane. Well, look, that's a 30 degree impact angle. And what that means is if you add a little bit of bad on that, so I'm approaching it maybe 65 to 70, I maintain control of the airplane and I collide into the ground at best with the drag, I'm probably going to survive. And then, of course, for light sport and uh, European advanced ultralight, this 45 knot number also makes sense. It says basically if you don't fly directly into a wall, you'll probably live through it. So as you're designing, you want to have this curve in mind also. Okay, and uh, once again, I'll, I'll try to make it quick here, but you know, from a designer's viewpoint, you have to keep, take the view that I can't depend on the pilot skill to overcome issues with the airplane, because we're just not that proficient. Most of us, when we get a chance to go flying, aren't out there practicing departure stalls. We're just going flying. And so uh, it's amazing what percentage of accidents are still stall spins. So ideally, you want an airplane that is going to um, wait for the pilot to catch up when the situation gets ahead of the pilot's brain. And worst case, if the pilot is stupid and insists on continuing to pull back on the stick and flail it around, the airplane will wobble around and mush a bit, but it isn't going to depart and hit the, note, hit the ground nose down. So that's the problem we're up against. What can we do about it? Well, you know, lots of people have been thinking about that. Well, you know, a couple of things have come along, and some of them actually have done some good. You know, the last time um, I uh, heard from Boris Popov at BRS, they were claiming over 250 lives saved in DRS deployments. That's a big deal. Uh, and then, you know, stall spin resistance is nothing new. You can go back to the air group with Fred White. And, you know, one of the things that's very cool, when I was a graduate student, I had the privilege of working on a flight test uh, with Fred, uh, who was an amazing guy, because I remember when I was doing that, I was, I think, 20 years old, and Fred was 80, and I couldn't keep up with him. You know, which now that I am closer to Fred's age, not there yet, much closer to what, what Fred was then than what I was then, uh, you know, I keep looking to Fred as an example of how to get old properly. You know, because he was actually out here at Oshkosh at 92 giving a four minute dance. You know, so that's something to be aspired to. And also, what we were working on at the time was this use of a discontinuous leading edge stuff to make an airplane more, more spin resistant. So that definitely helps. And then there have been various studies about um, taking manufacturing costs out of conventional airplanes. The Republic CD was a first attempt, uh, and uh, it's actually not on here, but they were using big stamping machines to make wing skins with no ribs, to cut the parts count down, to cut the assembly time down. Uh, the Amy Trojan actually was interesting because they put the ribs on the outside to make it easier to rivet them on, and the wings were symmetric, so all four skins were symmetric. Um, not the most gorgeous airplane in the world. Uh, Rockwell 112, they were playing the same game. And the problem with some of these airplanes is they tended to give up performance 
and they didn't gain enough in cost to make the difference. And you know, back when NASA was still doing GA stuff, uh, they were looking at some of the same ideas in uh, in what uh, Republic was doing on the CD to see if they couldn't make some of that in. Uh, but you know, as people who know me well know, I tend to, to look at a problem in the most boringly conventional way possible. And so the basic idea is, okay, this is not solving the problem. So you know, we go to one of the great teachers of engineering, to it, Monty Python, and say, and now for something completely different, which turns out to be this. So here's the idea is, so let's address this problem by completely changing the architecture of the airplanes rather than trying to do the conventionally architected airplane a little bit better. And so uh, I'm not slagging on Randy Schlitter, by the way, with this chart. I like Randy. But the S9 and the Facet Mobile had, had the same engine, which is why I use them as a comparison. Uh, Facet Mobile is actually a little bit faster than the S9, lands slower. And the real thing is, about the time I'm finished building the fuselage and he started on his wings, I'm going flying because of the low parts count in the simple manufacturing. So this is a very attractive thing. But you know, if you look at low aspect ratio airplanes as a class, because you know, God knows I did not invent all of this or even most of it. Uh, uh, if you look out near the ground arch right now, this airplane is sitting out there. Uh, John Dyke's original prototype, Dyke Delta. This airplane changed my life. I saw a picture of it on the cover of uh, Air Progress in 1972 when I was, I think, 16 years old and just went, okay, that's cool. You know, now it took years for me to start figuring out why it works. And then, of course, another of my all time favorite airplanes ever, the Avro Vulcan. Another example, aspect ratio three bomber that before the B2s hit Kosovo, uh, actually in its raid on Port Stanley during the Falklands War, had flew the longest combat air mission ever flown by heavier than air airplane. Well, yes, they had error with fielding, but you still can't end up with a terribly inefficient airplane. And then you go back in history, and there were a lot of the West of British airplanes that flew better than conventional wisdom said they should. There was the Aero from the 30s. Uh, interesting story there is the inspiration for that wing shape was the a felt heel lift. The guy who designed it was a podiatrist. Uh, he thought he got bored one day and he was flipping things around in his shop, and his heel lift kind of glided pretty well. And he said, hey, that'd be a good way to build an airplane. You, know, you never know. And then there have been a whole lot of other interesting ones. Uh, I love David Rose. This is he's on on number four now in Australia. He calls them useless flying objects. Uh, and there's actually a video he's out on YouTube. And you know, Milton Hatfield was a little bird. Milt was a test pilot who flew the Arabs, and then he went to decide to build his own in his, in his old age. Milt's not with us anymore, unfortunately. And Mark Fury, he's in, in uh, I think he's in Belgium, is experimenting now with this Delta, and he's just come out with a two blades version. So there's been a whole bunch of these, uh, and you know they work pretty well. Now the next step beyond the low aspect ratio is to get rid of everything. You know, go, go to what one of the all-time greats in aeronautics said. You know, if it doesn't lift, get rid of it, which was Jack Northrop's philosophy, uh, and say go to an all-lifting configuration. Now you can get very theological here about what's a lifting body, what's a blended wing body, what's a flying wing. Now a lot of that depends on whether you work for Northrop or Boeing, <laughs> because Boeing couldn't bear to call their airplane a flying wing because that's a Northrop trademark, so they invented blended wing body. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, the basic idea of all of these configurations is that everything lifts. You're not dragging anything through the air that's not working for a living. Uh, interestingly enough, Northrop got some of the benefit of what I learned on Facet Mobile because I worked for Northrop, and I did all the aero design on the X-47. And so in a very weird sort of way, the X-47 is the Facet Mobile's younger stepbrother. Uh, but what does this configuration do for me? Well, it's lightweight because it's structurally lightweight. Everything's thick, and there's not a lot of any moment. A uh, very simple structure. They have very benign flying qualities. The thing won't stall, won't spin. It just mushes the nose to stick back. Because the, the cord is so large, 
lean cord on the basketball goes 14 and a half feet, it's very tolerant of center of gravity travel. You know, when I brought the classical bill out to Oshkosh for, uh, for the show, I was flying from California. So I've been flying all along, and I said, okay, I'm gonna need some extra range. So I put a ferry tank, a 13 gallon ferry tank, a foot behind the CG, and then I needed two-stroke oil, so I put 20 pints of two-stroke oil at about a pound a pint in a rucksack, and I hung that from the rear bulkhead, which was five feet behind the CG, <laughs> and the trim lever moved a quarter of an inch. And that's the only thing I could detect in terms of the change in flying qualities. You know, try that with your, with your RV6, you know, or something like that. Not that I'm knocking them, they're great airplanes, but you understand what I'm saying. I could put a whole lot of weight, a whole ways out. CG did not move enough for the airplane to carry. The other thing you gotta love is there's a huge roomy cabin. I can sit in that airplane and put both hands straight out from my hand, sides and not touch anything. I have to lean over to reach inside of the windows. So it's time to stop theorizing and start building. Right, I mean, all of us have ideas, but it doesn't count until you've got a real flying hardware. And of course, for any EA or that's about as good a moment as it gets. I mean, I remember when I was 16 years old and I got my first issue of sport aviation, and I said, the way to do this right is to do something wild and original and show up out of the sky with no warning and knock your socks off. Well, guess what? It took me 20 years from that moment, but I did it. And I will tell you something. The feeling of landing on that runway in something that you conceived yourself and built yourself at the end of a long cross country is unbelievable. You know, it's 25 years since it happened, and I still get goosebumps thinking about it. So what was our objective? Well, stop talking and start testing. You know, because there was another bit of a moment that sort of was a part of the conception of the basketball field. It was probably around 1988, 89. I was walking down the flight line here at Oshkosh in the evening, and I came upon the most god-awful thing I had ever seen in an airplane. It was this little biplane. It was all dirty and it had kind of lumpy surfaces here and there, and the canopy literally was like saying held together with sheet metal screws. And I'm standing there thinking uncharitable thoughts about this airplane, and then I realized, yeah, but he finished his airplane that's on the flight line at Oshkosh, and yours is a sketch on a quad pad. Who are you to be criticizing? Get to work. Uh, and I am very happy to say that, yes, we did generate a bunch of UFO reports. <laughs> you know, I, I flew all the way across the country at about 2,000 feet over the highways. I wish I had a CV. Uh, and uh, I think we won the Dead Grass Award uh, for 1994, certainly for Oshkosh. I think it was the weirdest airplane ever to fly to Oshkosh until Bert brought the boomerang, and then, okay, fine, Bert, you win. Uh, okay, here's the answer to the question. No, it was not for reasons of the F-117. It was not because I was trying to make a statement, it's because I was trying to have a simple structure. So the next question is, well, okay, all those corners, doesn't the airflow separate? No. This is a wind tunnel test. These are tufts. This is a 30 degrees angle of attack. And you can see the leading edge vortex here, you can see that the flow is still attached. You can actually see a little bit of separation right in under the fins. And actually, when you bring the airplane back to full out stick, you can hear that. You can hear it sounds like someone's tapping on the fins. And so, you know, we came to Oshkosh. This is day one as I was tying the airplane down. And, you know, I mean, we were literally mopped before we even got the airplane tied down. And one day later, while I was out in the flyby pattern, because they let us do that, you can see there's a perfect outline of the airplane. <laughs> and uh, once again, you know, I had the good fortune to go to the University of Michigan and study under Ed Lesher, who built the Teal. And uh, he was here. That was his 80th birthday. And I will tell you something. He came, he looked at the airplane, he got inside, came out, that big smile on his face, and he looked at me and said, this is really good part of me. <laughs> that meant more to me 
And the award I got that year, and all those other people, because that's the man who taught me. And that's like Obi-Wan handing you your lightsaber and saying, you have learned well, young Padawan, you are now a Jedi. It was wonderful. So what did we actually achieve with this airplane? Aluminum tube, fabric covering, nothing fancy. The only composite in it was a, was a cowling, which was made of fiberglass. Uh, it weighed 370 pounds, empty on the ramp, including the BRS, full the upper instruments, ready to go. Uh, that airplane would carry its own empty weight and useful load. We carry 300, we could, we could fly as heavy as 740 pounds. Normally, I float a little lighter than that. On 46 horsepower, we're getting 102 knots true at 4,000 feet wide open. I average almost 80 knots point to point from California to here, including pattern time and everything. 46 horsepower. And if you hold the stick hard back, it sinks at a thousand feet a minute in a level attitude, doesn't roll, doesn't depart, and all the controls still work. So I won't say this airplane won't kill you because pilots are remarkably innovative, <laughs> but you would have to work at it. So with that done, the next step is let's let's design a two-place, because that's really you know what we want to where we want to head. And so this was the next generation, which was designed in 1995, called the FMX5. Uh, it got as far as a 20% scale RC model and a wind tunnel model. The results look very, very good. And one of the things it demonstrated is one of the things that gives you the safety of a low aspect ratio configuration. And that is the curve of lift coefficient versus angle of attack has a flat top. So here's, on this airplane, you would approach to land at between 15 and 16 degrees angle of attack. A good bit goes up, but that's getting it nice and slow, right? Max lift is at 30. Now, when you consider the fact that a typical light airplane stalls at about 12 and is at zero lift at about, oh, zero. I have as much angle of attack margin to max lift as I have margin from zero lift if I'm an approach. And at full out stick, I can go all the way up to 40 degrees angle of attack and the lift never drops off. But it's a cool characteristic, I know it's weird. The other thing it does, which is really nice, this is pitching moment, nose up is this way, nose down is that way, this is increasing angle of attack. If I pull the stick hard back and try to trim it to high angle of attack, right around the time it gets the maximum lift, it pitches nose down. So it's self angle of attack, I mean, you can't trim it above 25 degrees. So it means you sit there and pull out the stick, you're really just goes to max lift and sits there and says, okay, drag's kind of high, we're sinking a bit, boss, what do you want to do about this? You know, I'm waiting. And you could actually mush it to the ground like that. Now, you know, at a thousand feet per minute, I wouldn't advise it for the safety of your landing gear. Yeah. But unless you would tell yourself on a flat pole, you'll probably survive. Which means, when we get back to the curve of doom, you know, I lose into my Cessna 150, stall it, not good. In my low aspect ratio airplane, I can float in at about 45 knots, high angle of attack, under control, dump the energy, and walk away. Now, I did not want to prove this in quite the dramatic way I actually ended up doing so. But you know, in 1995, at 600 feet altitude on what would have been a base leg after take off from Blythe, my two-stroke decided to stop stroking. I had three choices. Continue straight ahead and land on the highway and argue with the semis turn a little bit and land in the gas station. That didn't seem like a good idea either. Turn back to the airport and pull the BRS. If I had been in a conventional airplane, I would have pulled the BRS. Instead, because I was flying this, I turned to the airport. As I said, if I had been three feet higher, I would have made it over the damn fence. But nonetheless, I was able to make that turn, have the airplane under control, and when it came clear, I was coming up short, flare hard, almost like a hang glider, dump the energy, touch down, flat through the fence, tore the nose gear out of it, came to a stop, the airplane rolled a total of 75 feet from where it touched the ground to where it stopped. And then I got out as a very unhappy but completely intact person. So, as I said, I didn't want to prove it that dramatically, but by God, it works. 
Um, so, uh, about this time, you know, we had FMX5 design, the project really wasn't going on, and I got a call from a gentleman in Oregon named Tim Lockenmeyer, who runs a company called Near Space Corporation, and they had a problem. They're putting payloads up on super high altitude balloons. They want to build a glider to get them home. They need lots of volume, they need cheap, they need light, and have I got, a, have I got something for you? So in the end, we built uh, basically uh, about a one-third scale FMX-5 as a high altitude payload return glider. It's called the Talon Topper. Uh, they actually built about 30 of these. And uh, it's still operational. NASA is using it for testing right now. And this is what we achieved with it. This is actually quite quite a while ago, so that's why I added the pluses to all these. But uh, we've had them come home from as far as 85 miles down range, as high as uh, 100,000 feet. By actual measurement, this thing has an L over D of about eight in glide, which for an aspect ratio 1.5 with facets is not bad. Yeah, I know it topples your gyros, but I got lots of data to prove it. Okay, we had two of them because of control malfunctions dive supersonic and recover. Which I find just amazing. I designed this configuration to fly at 9,000 feet at 120 knots, and two of them survived being vertical dives at Mach 1.05 at 85,000 feet. So you never know how things are going to go on. Now, ironically enough, the money I got paid for this, I used to buy a Cessna 150, so it actually supported my general aviation habit uh, in its own way. Okay, so. We've proven by experiment that it does work. The question is why? Because you know there's lots of conventional wisdom that says low aspect ratio equals inefficient. Right? I don't want to tell you. The induced drag is really high, it's gonna be high drag. Yeah, maybe you can make it work with a big enough engine. But you know, okay, 100 knots on 46 horsepower for 300 pounds of useful load doesn't sound so inefficient to me. So what are we doing here? Well, uh, for that you have to get into a little bit of the mathematics of the thing. So I know a few of your eyes are going to glaze over, but just try to read, get the last conclusions on the charts with the math in them. Uh, the basic idea here is you look at a concept called transport efficiency. And that is, what's the mission of an airplane? I'm trying to transport a payload from point A to point B. So what I care about is not what the lift to drag ratio is, or what the structural weight fraction is, or what any specialist engineer would care about. I care about the total drag per unit payload payloads and drag ratios, because that says that for every pound of payload I'm transporting, how many pounds of drag does that motor have to push through? That's what I, in the end, care about. So once I know that, I can start looking at it from a, a, a multidisciplinary, full vehicle viewpoint. And when you get done with all the math, which I am not going to torture you with, what you discover is that the payload to drag ratio is the useful load fraction, that's the payload over gross weight, times the lift to drag ratio. And that's a beautiful number, because it's really simple. This relates to the aerodynamic effectiveness of the configuration. This relates to the structural efficiency of the configuration, and it lets you trade the two directly. And it lets you compare very dissimilar configurations directly also. So if we start looking into components of this equation, first thing, let's look at weight. I went back and started looking at historical data, okay? This is useful load fraction. This is aspect ratio. Every one of those dots is a real airplane. Notice that the low aspect ratio airplanes are on a very different curve than the high aspect ratio airplanes. Fastmobile had a payload, a useful load fraction of 50%. John Dyke, Dyke Delta, all these others are above 45. Now I get into my conventional airplanes and they're down around 35%. So that's a big deal. That means I'm carrying around a lot of extra airplane per unit payload. And by the way, when I start talking about cost, remember we buy airplanes by the pound. And I'm paying for the empty weight. Now the other thing is when I get into the aero world, uh, once again, I'll spare you all the math, but when you take a look at lift and drag ratio for real, I care about span, span efficiency, wetted area, and skin friction coefficient, which is how much how hard the air is basically rubbing on the skin. That's the whole story. Well, one of the things that's cool about low aspect ratio wall lifting configurations, they don't have wing root junctions, they don't have interference drag at, at the root, 
They have very nice nearly elliptic span loads. And if you use tip fins, they're end plated. So you can get very high span efficiencies. Now, this is from the FMX5 wind tunnel test. And this is a 0.9 span efficiency parabolic polar plotted against the real data. And that's without the tip fins. Just to put that in perspective, a typical low wing light plane can be in the 0.7 to 0.75 range. High wing airplanes are get to 88%. The worst I've ever measured was on a Rocco Commander 112 in flight at 56%, which was a very powerful argument for wing group fillets. Now the other interesting thing is a parameter called Reynolds number, which is proportional to cord and airspeed, and it has to do with how viscous the air feels to the airplane. Well, when you have a mean core of 14 feet, you're flying a much higher Reynolds number than when you have a mean core of 4 feet. And the net result of that is that even though the, the low aspect ratio airplane has more skin, it's paying about 18 to 20% less parasite drag per unit skin area as a conventional airplane. And what happens is when you add all those effects together, although the low aspect ratio airplane is still slightly less efficient aerodynamically than the conventional airplane. The structural weight fraction overpowers that. And for a certain class of airplanes, you actually end up with a more efficient configuration. But once again, let's, let's compare real airplane to real airplane. So if we're talking light sport category airplanes, let's compare the Cessna 150 to the Fastmobile. Um, this is, look, the drag ratio is a function of speed. This is Fastmobile, Cessna 150, case closed, Fastmobile sucks. That's what the aero guy will tell you, right? But when I put the weight in and look at transport efficiency, guess what? When I get in the cruise range, they're the same. With much, much lower parts count, much simpler, much lighter. Well, about this time, NASA had a program called GAP. Uh, well, general, general aviation propulsion, and then also, uh, hey, personal air vehicle exploration, run by a gentleman named Mark Moore. And they were here at Oshkosh showing various outlandish, funny looking things like that. Um, and I went up to Mark in the old NASA building, and I said, you know, I've already built an airplane that does about 75% of what you're trying to do. And he looked at me, he said, the Fastmobile, and he laughed in my face. And then in about three minutes and 47 seconds, speaking at 170 words per minute, custom to 200, I gave him essentially this briefing. At the end of which he said, that's interesting, he gave me a contract to do a study. And so I'm going to share a little bit of the results of that study with you. And by the way, this is published. The uh, report's linked to fastmobile.com, or you can look at look up my name, look up Wayne Fan in the NASA Technical Report Server, and you can get all of this in painful detail, uh, which I can't cover here with any. So uh, what we did is we did a study configuration based off FMX5. This is what it was supposed to look like. The basic idea here is this airplane was going to be an IKEA plane. It was going to be made of all flat panel basically commodity board, honeycomb panels, NC cut, and then fastened with potted in inserts around, around the edges to take manufacturing out of it. Uh, these are what the numbers said for, the, for what it would be. This is how the thing was planned to go together. Uh, now I'm going to show you some numbers. I want to just give you a little idea what the pedigree of the numbers. All the weights that we used on this were either actual numbers from the facet mobile or statistical correlation from existing airplanes. We didn't create anything from both law. All of the aerodynamics were based on facet mobile flight test, parasite drag numbers, and the polar shape from the FMX5 wind tunnel test. So once again, all of this was anchored in experimental data. Comparing this airplane, and we were paying to the performance and useful load of a, of a standard trainer airplane at the time. So if you take a look at this, what we ended up with was an airplane that was about 635 pounds empty, uh, you know, 530 pounds useful load. But the important thing here is I've got half the empty weight to get about the same performance with a very simple to manufacture airplane. Uh, and once again, you look at weight fractions here. This was the empty weight and useful load. The thing that's really interesting here is what an awful weight fraction the composite airplanes have. You know, and it's really interesting because as I'll show you in a moment, even though the DA20 is dramatically better aerodynamically, 
it turns out that its actual performance is about the same as the low aspect ratio of airplane because of the difference in weight. So once again, here's the arrow curve. Hey, guess what? The diamond wins. Now, with the slightly less low aspect or on the low aspect, aspect ratio airplane, this is starting to get interesting. Because even though the 150 and the low aspect ratio are going to have the same max L over D, the low aspect ratio airplane has it shifted to higher airspeed. So on here where I'm cruising, oddly enough, the low aspect ratio airplane actually has a higher L over D than the conventional one. And it's lighter. This is starting to get good. So now if I look at actual power required to fly as a function of airspeed, well, the poor old 152 kind of, it's a 152. I have one, I love it, I don't expect it to be anything but what it is. Uh, but what's really interesting is that the low aspect ratio and the DA20 are so close. DA20 still wins by a little bit. But this is with the DA20 having 400 and something pounds of useful load and the low aspect ratio airplane having 530 pounds of useful load. So if you were to actually try to move the DA20 up into the same useful load as the low aspect ratio airplane, those curves would come together. And this is within the experimental error of what I can calculate. So this is interesting because what it says is I get the same level of performance as a very, an airplane that requires a lot of expensive tooling and costs a lot more just because there's more mass in it with a very simple construct that, by the way, has twice the width of the cabin and won't stall and won't spin. When I look at rate of climb, it's also interesting. Once again, poor old 150 just doesn't do that well. The low aspect ratio of climbs really well at low altitude because the power weight is so good. As you get to higher up, the short span starts to bite you compared to the long span on the DA20. But, you know, the time to 5,000 feet is about the same. Most of us don't fly much higher than that unless we're out west. And the thing is, you know, even out at 10,000 feet, the DA20 is climbing a little better. Uh, and yeah, the DA20 has got a slightly better service cylinder on the other bit. Now, the thing I must point out for this comparison is the low aspect ratio airplane is doing it with 80 horsepower and the DA20 is doing it with 120. Because we were pegging the performance. If I put the 120 horsepower engine in the low aspect ratio airplane, it's no contest. Now, of course, I just eat my cost of that because put a bigger engine in it. But we're home builders, we're also bigger. <laughs> Take off, same thing, really interesting. Because the low aspect ratio airplane has a high power to weight ratio because it's light and a low wing loading, it wants to fly. So the low aspect ratio airplane is going to 50 feet through 50 feet about the time the Cessna is rotating for takeoff. And the DA-20 pilot is thinking about whether he really got the density altitude or not this day. Because what's happening here is the low power to weight of the DA-20 is hurting it on, on raw acceleration. Remember our curve of doom. Here's my stall speeds in knots. Here's my approach speeds, ground rolls, 50 foot landing obstacles. It's the low aspect ratio airplane, because of the low wing loading, comes out again every time. So, in a lot of things, the low aspect ratio airplane ends up superior uh, in terms of cruise performance. It's as good or slightly better. And it's a hell of a lot cheaper, it's a hell of a lot roomier. And if you screw up on base to final, it won't kill you. I think this is worth a little more work. So, what's happened recently? Well, you know, since FMX5 was designed, the new light sport rule came along. Well, this makes the low aspect ratio even more interesting because it has a very low empty weight. Well, if the rules are pegging your max gross, every pound I can take out of empty weight is a pound I can put into useful load. Okay, I'll show you some results. Bear with me, I've got some numbers, yes. Assuming that I am not using the optimist key on my calculator, they're pretty eye-watering. Now, I'll use the mildly, I do use the mildly optimistic key on my uh, calculator, but what inventor doesn't? So basically the idea was to take what we learned, 
and do something really aimed at the light sport world. And you know, most of you guys know this, so I'm not going to play with it. So I actually took some pictures of this last year. This is a cart model of what I'm calling FMX7. A couple of features here, uh, slightly more sophisticated faceting. Uh, this brake is because the span's now 22 feet. I want to be able to take the outer panels off for road transport. That's the reason the fins were moved inboard, is so that I'm not disconnecting controls. Now all of the controls can be run off the center body, including the L-bonds, which you run off the inboard end of the, of the push pole. So I tried to say, okay, what, what's this thing going to weigh? So I estimated the weight a whole bunch of different ways, fabric and metal covering, 0200 and 0235, um, and then I did an incremental off of the Dyke Delta, I did an incremental off of the FMX4, and I did it parametrically. So bottom line is, in the end, I have empty weights varying from at most 740 pounds to maybe down as low as 560. And that gives me useful loads of well over 500 pounds, 580 to maybe as much as set a little over 700. Now, I mean, I think that's worth the experiment. If I can really build a light sport airplane with a 700 pound useful load. Uh, the only thing I know for sure is I am not willing to sit in an airplane long enough to burn the amount of gas I could put in that airplane if it's just me and the other 500 pounds of gas. So once again, some of the other numbers look real nice. With, with On the NASA study, we were using 80 horsepower, so it cruised at 150 knots. Now, with these two, where I'm going to the 0235 or the 0200, I'm deliberately dialing the prop pitch down so I don't blow through the 120 knots. And so it looks like, you know, with 600 pounds of useful load, an 0235 powered airplane like this would be climbing 1,500 feet a minute at sea level. One of the things that's interesting is if I take that 0235 powered FMX7 peg the speed at the level flight maximum speed of my 152, I'll be climbing about 800 feet a minute. So that's kind of a nice cruise climb. 800 feet a minute and 100 knots. Except it's about 20% more max lift. 
Yeah, that was point eight versus one in CL Max. Because after all, I designed that in 1995, and this one in you know 2017. I learned a little bit in that time. Uh, same characteristic we saw with FMX5 with the nose down pitch break. This is actually at a somewhat forward CG, so these curves will rotate a little bit. But once again, right out here at 25 degrees, you have that classical nose down pitch, pitching moment break. So it's time to get serious. So remember how EAA now has SolidWorks as a benefit. There's the beginning of the structural layout. We've just finished doing the finite element analysis of this, and I am now busy drawing tubes to make cut files. So if fate is kind and I don't limp out, and I make no promises about either of those things, uh, first quarter of next year I hope to be cutting metal on this airplane. And the other thing I'm sure some of you want to know about is, uh, as you probably know, uh, Bob Engel and the guys up at EAA Chapter 292 in Oregon have been building a reverse engineered original FMX4 with my blessing and assistance. Uh, this gives you an idea of what the structure of the whole thing looks like. They pioneered doing this idea of building all the solid and then seeing all the parts. They actually didn't see all the parts, including the gussets with the click holes. And so the thing's completely self-jigging. You see the airplane sitting on all the alignment tooling that was ever used to build it. Uh, and there's Bob sitting proudly in the thing. As you can see, uh, everybody has to add a few more rips to because you know, how much you tell them it was fine. Say, yeah, Bob, we're going to get a bigger engine on there, so we can go a little faster. Uh, this picture was taken about a week ago. Uh, and what Ernie tells me, Ernie Moreno, who's hiding in the back, tells me is as soon as he gets back, they're going to do a final pre cover inspection. It's actually been taxied, everything works. And they're going to cover it in the next few weeks. And so if fate is kind, by the end of the third quarter, this thing should have air under the wheels. And only 25 years behind schedule, there'll be another facetmobile in the air. And that will give me, you know, I'm sure a lot of the extra impetus to get my butt in here and do the FMX7 to get the next generation built. Because, you know, I mean, the more I look at it, the more I think, this is an airplane that needs to exist. And you know, I'm hoping I can put the resources together. Because really, the bottom line is, this configuration offers some really profound advantages for the kind of flying us normal pilots do. You know, if you're the kind of person who's going to be flying in a Lance Air 4, no, this ain't it. You know, if your flight profile looks like a cruise missile, no. If you want to go really fast at low altitude, no. But if you can really build an airplane, that will take over 600 pounds of useful load and cruise 120 knots on between 100 and 120 and 15 horsepower. You come down final at 50 and have enough room for all of us, even if we are not as little as we used to be, and won't stall and won't spin. I think that's worth pursuing. And so, you know, I'm going to continue working on this. I'm glad enough people are still interested. It's amazing to me. You know, it's been 25 years since the fast mobile was last seen in, in public. And the fact that you guys are here is, is way cool. And uh, with that, that's what I have in terms of prepared information. Thank you very much for your attention. And let's open it up for questions. Oh, question about how to get in and out of it. Oh, uh, okay. Details. Uh, <laughs> Cantry cream? Uh, you know, it, getting in and out is actually the biggest issue with these kinds of configurations. Fastable Bill had a hatch on the floor and actually went under the airplane and up to the floor. If you look at the Dyke Deltas, they have various kinds of opening canopies. Uh, on FMX7, I am going to do a top side door of some sort. It will have to either be a sliding door or a plug door because one of the things you have to watch out is your door is also on the top of your wing. There's a lot of section on it. If the door ever pops open, you're going down. 
John Dyke nearly lost it in the, in the JD2 back in the Rockford days. He took off the canopy, popped open, and he dumped it in the dirt between the runways because it wouldn't climb the canopy open. Mm. There's a lot of suction on that canopy. So that's one of the more difficult detailed design bits. Now, I'm going to put four hatches in the 7 also because I really like them. Uh, one of the things I particularly like about having a four hatch is when you're working on the avionics behind the panel. Instead of having to lie on your back on the seat working over your head, you stand up through the floor of the airplane. Uh, it also is, from an emergency viewpoint, I like the idea that if you ever do flip it over on landing, which is possible even with a, a nice, safe airplane, there's always potholes out there, then, uh, and the door is being held shut, the ability to go out the bottom of the tracks. But yes, that is one of the single biggest issues. Yes, sir. Is that also a 503 Is, oh, God, no. Uh, well, this is an electric model. The airplane, for the moment, I am baselining either a Continental 0200 or a Lightning 0235. Uh, you know, there are a variety of other engines that might work, but I'm getting conservative in my old age. So, that's the baseline. Can I just mark a large board? Mark the board? Yes. Put a 912 in there. A what? 912 Rotax. Uh, you may put a Rotex engine in your airplane, uh, while you know it has become one of the standards of the industry. For very personal reasons, which I will not litigate here, I'm never giving Rotex any of my personal money ever again, as long as I live. Uh, no two strokes either. Uh, I, and once again, you know I don't want to, you know, use this as a platform to talk about why I, I am not a comfortable Rotex company. There's lots of people flying those engines; they work fine. If a customer comes to me and says, I want you to put a 912 installation for my FMX7 and I'll pay for it, I'll be glad to engineer it for you. But it's not what I'm going to baseline for me personally, and that's because I'm a cranky old man and that's the engine I don't want in my airplane. Okay? <laughs> yes, sir. What's going in the Oregon one? What's going in the Oregon one? It's, it's a VW. It's a converted VW. Now, which is going to be interesting because they're going to have twice the horsepower I had. So uh, the rate of climb should be fascinating. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot hear you over the helicopter. Can somebody either relay or speak very loudly? Um, any unforeseen regulatory problems? Uh, well, almost by definition, I haven't foreseen any. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, no. You know, one of the lovely things in the United States is under our experimental custom built rules, the only rule is don't fall on anybody and don't take anybody who doesn't know what he's getting into for a ride. You know, so operating under light, under our uh, experimental custom build rules, I can build pretty much anything I want, and then they'll give me a test area to go test it. And if the unforeseen technical problem doesn't bite me, then I can sign the airplane off and operate it pretty normally. And once the point's proven, you know, then we're into a different world. Uh, well, let's let someone else get a first question. Ed? What would it take to be able to cruise at 150 knots, well, which is my threshold for useful cross country? What would it take to be able to cruise at 150 knots per line? That's my <laughs> threshold for useful cross country. I, I think, frankly, with a, an 0320, we could get there. But it's not what I'm designing for. Yes, sir. Okay. How does it handle rough air? Remarkably well. Uh, one of the cool things about low aspect ratio airplanes is although that lift curve slope is flat top, it's very very low low slope. So the amount of lift you get penetrating in dust is less than a high aspect ratio airplane. So uh, the feel is a bit different. There's more yaw in the motion and less even roll. But overall, you know, I was flying fast mobile around at three pounds per square foot wing loading, and I got beat up less than in my 150. Is it possible to spin it? A braver man than I may be able to provoke it enough, but I don't think so. Uh, the most I was willing to do, trying to see what it would do, was I did a wind-up turn in a 60-degree bank to pull out the stick. Keeping the stick on the stop, I took my foot off the rudder pedals and reversed the bank with the stick. And it did it and it didn't depart. Now, if I really aggressively cross-controlled it at full power or something like that, maybe. 
I, I'll never say absolutely no. But what I did show in my flight test pretty thoroughly is if I do the things that stupid pilots do in conventional airplanes to kill themselves, the airplane buffets a little bit to whack me upside the head because I'm being dumb, but stays under control, which I love about it. I mean, that's one of the real virtues of the configuration. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Will the Oregon results be written up in sport aviation? Will the Oregon results be written up in sport aviation? That's up to the editors of sport aviation and the owners of the airplane. I mean, I'm helping and encouraging the guys uh, Ernie's raising his hand. What's the answer, Ernie? I've been informed this morning that there's an article that after the test flight, and the EAA is the first one that's going to come out of the world on the earth. Glad to hear. It's going to be a feature article in the EAA coming out. Now, the other thing I'm going to remind Ernie since he's here is there's only one condition I set to letting them come reverse engineer my airplane. I made them promise that when they got one flying, they had to bring it to Oshkosh. So, you know, if fate is kind, one of these days, maybe next year, if we're really lucky, there'll be at least one fast and we'll out on the ramp. I'm very much looking forward to that day. You know, and we're for it. Uh, let's see, you did you get one question already? Okay, fine. Okay. If the aircraft is underneath, yes. and you land, and the gear collapses. Okay. He's asking about the bottom side entry and if the gear collapses. Well, first of all, 7 is going to have doors on both sides. On Facetmobile, I deliberately put the launcher on above the cockpit 30 inches apart, and it's fabric covered, and I had a knife where I could reach it. So that's the short answer. But yeah, I, would, I, I thought about that. Uh, aerodynamically, must it be faceted? Aerodynamically, must it be faceted? No. As a matter of fact, a smooth mobile would probably have slightly lower drag. <laughs> yeah. The faceting is simply to make it easy to build out of straight and flat stock. As a matter of fact, one of the things I did on this shape quite deliberately is if you look at it, it's got straight spars, so one could put curved ribs through here and then float a curved skin over that structure if you wanted to. You know, one of the things I would dearly love to do if I get a third group of students who wants to test, who wants another senior project, is to have them make another model with the facets smoothed out and do a comparative test because I'd really like to know how much I'm sacrificing with, with the faceting. Is, it, is the FMX 7 intended? Well. Is the 7 intended to be fabric covered? The answer is, at the moment, yes. And that is more a matter of what I personally can engineer and build with my personal skills than anything else. In other words, I love the idea of the NC uh, composite structure. I do not have the engineering skill to do a thin shell uh, composite structure that I would trust. I know I can do a tube and rack truss. And my analysis says that the weight penalty of simply skinning that with 020 aluminum is more than I want to eat. So for the moment, if I build one for me, it's going to be a tube and rack airplane. If other people want to get involved with lots of resources and they want to do it a different way, I'll be glad to take that meeting and have that conversation. But that's the path I'm following. And that's more a matter of a man's got to know his limitations. And it, it, would, it is the way to build the lightest airplane. But whether it's the overall best from a market viewpoint, I really can't tell. But, you know, I'm not building it to sell. I'm building it to have and to demonstrate. And if somebody wants to pick it up and do something with it, yeah, you know, let's talk. But uh, let's see. I'll get to you ahead. If anyone else wants a first question, go ahead and start first. Okay. Steel or aluminum tubes, gusset or welded? Uh, aluminum's and gusset mostly. Local steel in the high stress areas for the moment. Yes, sir. Yeah. I know you wanted a little over a year ago. Uh, vaguely. Okay, how much money you got? <laughs> I mean, yes. You know, we have drawn versions all the way from fast mobile to large mobile to huge mobile to vast mobile. You know, because, you know, the, some of these things actually look really attractive for a medium large 
this whole short haul transport. You know, you take this, you go to an 0540 and keep everything scaled, and you're probably talking about 3,000 pounds of useful load in a 140 knot airplane. And you want an airplane to camp at Oshkosh Point. Take that airplane and scale it up to about a 40 foot span. Hey, you have a flying Winnebago, it's got bumps in the sides, you get a big dust ruffle to put around the edges, so you got this marvelous shady area underneath, you know, little little gazebo on top to watch the air show from it, it'd be marvelous. It costs more than I can afford, but it'd be marvelous. What, you know, what year did you have it up at Oshkosh? What year did I have it up at Oshkosh? 1994, so this is the 25th anniversary of oh, us actually bringing it here. Yes, sir. I was talking, was I? It must have been really hot. <laughs> uh, I am not going to kid it. I'm, I'm, I've reached the age where I want to build it, I want to fly it. If someone else wants to undertake it and make me a good deal, uh, once I have a flying airplane, we can talk. No, not, I will not kid an RC model because I don't want to release the shapes. Well, the Fastmobile was already kitted, unauthorized, you know, and flying and made $4.50 and didn't even offer me a kit. Uh, but, you know, bottom line is, uh, I'm not releasing lines of this until, until I have a chance of flying it myself. And then, you know, I'm willing to take almost any reasonable or even semi-reasonable meeting about what we do with the future of it. You know, it's just something I think needs to exist. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, how long you got? Uh, the short answer is the best simulation tool is, tool is a large RC model. Uh, you know, I mean, X-Plane works semi sort of okay. Well, you can drop a totally random aircraft in next plane and get a totally random result. You know, the only way, however, I am a hardcore experimentalist. Analysis is a marvelous thing. And, you know, the modern tools are remarkably useful. There is no substitute for real data flying real hardware in real air. So I have built a lot of models. Some of them have survived their flight tests. The ones that have survived their flight test taught me almost as much as the ones that didn't. And uh, you can learn an awful lot in getting it dialed in and getting a model working. That's not, not the whole story, but it's a big piece of it. We've got about another three minutes, and then we've got to make sure that we're clear for the next speaker. Yeah, Marty. Uh, it looks like there's plenty of room for retracts, yes. And if you want to add weight and cost for essentially no good reason, go right ahead. You know, within the light sport rules, there's absolutely no reason to retract linear, and that fact is not even legal. Uh, you know, my studies have shown that if you do a good job of carrying a fixed gear, there's really very little benefit until you get out close to 200 knots. And what's interesting, you look at it, the people at Cirrus apparently agree with me, as did the people at Columbia, which became the Cessna of Allison and the TTX. Uh, and Lance there and all of those. So uh, I don't foresee building retracts in anything that I'm going to build. Uh, now for the look, sure. I mean, if we're using it for for a future apocalyptic movie, we'll maybe we'll, you know Mad Max 14. Maybe we'll we'll make a retractable gear version of of uh, of it and get this the, the crazy desert guy out of his Transavia truck into a fastmobile. But uh, that's about the only reason I would do it. All right. Anyone else? Very good. Well, thank you all very much for your attention. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, give me a moment or two to get get clear, and I'll be willing to you know talk to people out alongside here if you have any personal questions. But do give me a moment to get myself organized here before you swamp me and get going.